Wow, I love all the sounds of merriment in here. It's so wonderful. Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is our Wednesday night well of being. And yeah, really wonderful to be here with you all. I'm Eve, and I get to participate with you all in offering some teachings and guiding us through discussion. I see a lot of new faces. Welcome. Great to have you. See a lot of familiar faces. Love you. So happy you're here. And yeah, we're um, we're gonna. I said I was gonna finish the book tonight, but I don't. I don't think I'm ready quite yet. So we'll we'll see how it goes. If this is your first time, no problem. We're always kind of um, circling through with the themes of this book. And tonight we're gonna do a little bit more of a, a targeted practice coming back to the original themes that the book touches on, which is around how do we loosen a sense of our pain identity or the pain body, the way that we contract against the world. And then we start to believe that that contracting against the world is who we are. We mistake it for actually our uh, normal or natural state. But that'll take a little explaining. So I feel like it might be nice for us to just drop in together first for a moment. But when, you know, especially when there's new faces in here, I want to just orient you all to the space. And even if you're often here, it's orienting in the space can help us kind of down regulate, slow our breathing, show up. So just taking a moment truly and, and looking around the space other beings in this space, our wonderful compassionate warrior Mace at the door, who's keeping us protected in this space. Yeah, and you know, I think many of you already discovered this, but there is a bathroom, there's tea, there's water. After the sit, you're super welcome for any of that. There's more cushions if you wanna make yourself comfortable. And, you know, on warm days, we sometimes get an extra soundtrack here in the room. So there might be sound and that's okay. We'll, we'll find a way to include that with our practice. So now that we are hopefully a bit more oriented to this space, let's find our place in our posture. Even for a short sit, it can be so helpful to be delivered deliberate and intentional with our posture. Let's help through, especially the neck and shoulders by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears, and then exhaling down our back, twice more, inhaling up, and exhaling back, feeling the openness of the chest one more time. And it's really nice to find a place where our hands feel that they can rest easily. It could be on the knees or folded in the lap. We want to find a sense of softening through the face that can include the eyes being closed. Also totally good to have them partially open, letting light in. and feel that the spine is in a position that feels both upright and supple, kind of tall and soft, like the stem or the stalk of a flower, Be able to hold up this beautiful blossom of our head. And noticing just the slightest shift upward of the chest, almost as though the heart were pointing towards the sky. And the chin is just gently shifted towards the chest, not tucked in, but in a way to help our gaze, whether our eyes are open or closed, be gently cast downwards.
And with the next couple breaths, we'll help gather our attention and also balance these qualities of vividness and ease. So inhale, inviting vividness as though we were breathing up the length of our spine. And exhale with the mouth open, release. Once again, inhale, feeling that vividness, uprightness, pulling ourselves upward. And then the gentle release, mouth open. And twice more on the rhythm of your breath. for this preliminary stage of settling into practice it can be very helpful to flash upon our motivation for being here. Remembering that we're dedicating our mind, our heart, and our body in order to transform internally, be of support and service to others. And even though we may just be simply following our breath, that training could be the most valuable thing that we do this entire day. Dedicating ourselves entirely to this transformation and possibility of service. And then begin settling into the breath by experiencing the whole body as it is breathing in. And continuing that experience of the whole body as you're breathing out. Feeling the body from within the body, not looking down upon or imagining an idea of the body, really feeling the body breathing in. And feeling and sensing the body breathing out, and letting the mind anchor here, rest here. And when thoughts, memories, or images arise, relax, release, and just return. A bit longer here, really experiencing the whole body as it's breathing in. And the whole body as it's breathing out. And as we've been noticing the body, there may be areas of tension, maybe especially around the eyes or the neck and shoulders, maybe the chest or belly. And for a couple moments, just imagine and feel that we could release and melt some of that tension with our next exhales.
Continuing with a bit more of our mindfulness of breathing, noticing the sensations of breath at the rise and fall of the abdomen. Breathing in and the belly rises, breathing out and it gently deflates. We can add a little bit of effort by pressing our belly button back towards our spine, pushing out the very last of our breath. So inhale, fully breathing in so that the belly rises, feels full. And then exhale, very gently, slowly, evenly pushing out. And continue with this more full phase of breathing. couple more moments, really letting our mind fully enter this experience of the breath filling completely and the breath emptying completely. And then returning to your natural breath and bringing the focus more narrowly to the subtle sensations of breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. Breathing in, feeling that cool air traveling in. And breathing out, noticing that warm air as you exhale. ever more refined in our focus, ever more settling, ever more entering the breath with our attention and awareness. And then gently letting go of this more narrow focus and just allowing the mind to feel a bit more open and spacious and just being breath by breath without any specific area of attention or focus. Soft through the face, the belly, chest, vivid, upright through the spine.
Thank you for your practice. A little bit of an appetizer practice before we do what is next. So I wanna revisit this theme of the pain body or pain identity. And this is something not exclusive to Wang Gyal Rinpoche. This is something many teachers talk about. I should mention this, this book we've been reading for those who are new is called The True Source of Healing. And Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche is a teacher in the Ban tradition, which is the indigenous tradition of Tibet, which has a bit more of a shamanic background and lineage, kind of drawing in elemental practices. And in this particular book, he invites us to use these three precious pills to really help us find a connection back home to ourselves. And he uses the term soul retrieval, which is interesting because that's a, a term that's used among a variety of different shamanic backgrounds. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what he means on that. But first, just talking about the pain identity or the pain body. Do people in the room have kind of some sense of what that is? I know for many folks who've been here before, like the pain body identity. That way when we kind of feel kind of contracted or tight, when we're really stuck or fixed in a certain way of being, when we're inflexible and rigid, it's helpful to think about like where we carry this pain identity in our body or how we carry it. Um, and that's not just the physical pain. Many people experience pain in the shoulders, in the neck, the low back, the gut. These are very common areas where we see that psychological distress can manifest through the body. Um, but there's also these kind of more little tells or these little signs of how we carry our, especially our contraction and our anxiety. So I know for myself, I, I picked this up um, maybe five or six months ago, when I feel even a little nervous, I kind of pull in like this. Also it includes if I'm in a rush, if I, like today I gave a presentation and I was pretty nervous and for about 45 minutes, I was like, stop, stop, stop. You know, like I just couldn't help myself. There was this like inner pulling of like, not sure. It's, it's interesting and it can be helpful to know where that is. And when you notice it and can identify that way that we get a little contracted or not at ease, that can be a warning sign or a helpful way for us to know to dip in to a more spacious like place. Anybody know or have a sense of where that is for them that they're willing to share? Shoulders yeah. like this? Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, so it's so true. Like people after meditation will often say, I didn't even know my shoulders were up here until I was practicing and they came back down. Anywhere else people notice? Yes, and do you mind using the mic? You can just grab it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, my jaw, especially, mm -hmm. is clenched. Yeah. And also my posture is very much forward and very much like I'm trying to focus on just a narrow view of the world ahead instead of looking around. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, like all clamped and down and then the posture forward. Yeah. Um, for me, it's various places. I yeah. think one I noticed last week is stomach. Yeah. I want to feel nervous. I just feel like a pinch. In my yes. Stomach. Yeah. It's so common. Um, and some of those, like we can, you know, with the stomach, we can't willfully do it, but it's obviously happening as a result of our experience. But with this, like I'm actually doing it, which is so funny that I have so little control over it. Um, anybody else notice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, like locations of like previous pain or injury mm -hmm. to get like phantom pain. Yeah. And it's like not related to that 
place even <laughs> yes so it's like the echo memory of it yeah. and like a sensitivity it's like nervous system remembering or something yeah no. yeah yeah and again it's not none of this is like bad or wrong per se it's really um you know a way that we're trying to self-soothe which is beautiful but we want to get a little farther like up the stream from the pain identity. It would be really cool to not make that face that I make because it's not very cool <laughs> for sure. Um, but more that I'm interested in, in it because it shows me like what's happening, like what's happening right here. And can I like m work my way up? One thing that Wangel Rinpoche talks about a lot is, um, how that that's pain identity, and I mentioned this before, it can become so familiar to us. It's it's just it's like the water we swim in. We don't even recognize that there's a, a different way of being. It just seems like who we are. There is, you know, stressed out, uncomfortable, disconnected, or uh pleasantly distracted. Right. And then back to disconnected. Um, right. There's instead of what maybe some of us had for one breath in practice, just like a natural state of flow, a natural state of being. And in these three precious pills that Wangel Rinpoche shares, our natural state of being as stillness, as silence, as openness and warmth. So nice. <laughs> such a nice idea, such a nice way to um kind of turn our mind towards to become more familiar and um yeah one of the things i think we can really see with the with the pain identity is it's how we react against the world like against what the world is offering us it's kind of like our oh like i don't want this i want it to be different like let's change it um, and he, you know, he talks, he talks a lot about, we can actually have a sense of openness with whatever is happening and we can make our relationship more positive with whatever is happening and that the pain identity really highlights when we have a separate sense of us, who we are, what we want and our agenda. And we're putting that on the world. Anybody ever do that? Like we want it to go our way, right? We want to control things. And again, it's very natural. We want to be safe. We want to feel connected and at ease. And then we just get, and sometimes it's so, it's, I don't know, it's, it's good and bad. It's so nice when that actually works. Like we want things to go a certain way and they do, and we feel good. And we're like, yes, this is working. And then something doesn't work. And all of a sudden, you know, we're just um, kind of back into that contracted state. So that ping ponging back and forth. And he says that a lot of this, you know, is, us responding to, you know, early wounding, you know, difficulty that we've had early in our life and these kind of patterns and that inability to let go of the fixation of how we want it to be, how it should be, which is so in the way. Um, so, yeah, let me read a little bit from him. It's just, it's just so beautiful. His descriptions of these. He says, I want to make a distinction between the pain and the pain identity. If we do not clear the pain identity, remove the root cause of pain or sickness, our practice will no, be no more effective than taking aspirin every day for a tension headache. Without addressing the cause, the symptoms will keep coming back. Though I think taking aspirin for attention headaches kind of great. <laughs> I'm just saying, I get what he's saying. Uh, and, and he says that when we suffer, it's because there is an I that is experiencing the pain. This grasping onto our sense of self, we perpetuate our suffering. Um, and this, this idea of kind of grasping and sense of self as a, the actual source of our pain so core to the Buddhist teachings. And for many people, this is familiar. And 
it can really come off in a very strange way because how are we to be if we're not to identify with ourselves? To identify with Raph or with Tara or with Ron? Am I another person? Like, how do we identify if we're trying to not have this fixed sense of self? And I think the easiest way to describe it is you just hold it really lightly. So it's not that I don't, you know, consider who I am and what I need to do in the world and all the accumulated experiences of my daily life, but I can also let those go and have this, you know, moments or minutes where I'm just a simple being, breathing, experiencing everything through my senses. And that like unconfigured self, uh, that self without, you know, what I'm doing next, what just happened, who I need to be, to be able to exist there that is so deeply nourishing and helps kind of penetrate the, you know, the solidness of always constructing this pain identity. Sometimes this is called the separate self structure, you know, this whole other identity or an identity project, this way that we've created a version of what we think the world wants from us. I know. And it takes up all of our goddamn time, right? <laughs> Because that includes, you know, our comparisons, like, are we going to, you know, move through the world at any time, kind of looking at what's happening around us without judgment? Like, that's very hard when we're not constructing our identity. We're judging, is that person better than me? Are they worse than me? Like, how do they reflect me? It's, 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 it's quite a lot for us to do. And, you know, especially in certain parts of our life, we get even more fixated. Um, he says it's really important when we are looking at and starting to get clear on the pain identity is to know where it's like sticky for us. Like, is it in our personal intimate relationships? Is it uh, with family, which could also be our personal intimate relationships? Is it with work? Is it more with our partner or in dating? And I'm I'm curious again from folks, is there a space or place where you feel the presence of that contracted sense of self more present? Not that it's absent anywhere, but that in certain contexts, there's more of a kind of presentation mode, maybe more of a kind of rigidity mode, or maybe even that there's different forms of pain identity we're presenting in those different arenas. Does that resonate for anyone? Yeah. Which is which one's hardest? Least pleasant? My parents. Parents, okay. Let's make sure they're not gonna watch this recording later. We won't we know no one even heard that. It's not even on the recording. Yeah, and what's that pain identity like? Yeah. Young. Yeah. Scared. No, she wants to remain anonymous. She's in a witness protection program. She's the microphone to go for her, though. So I know, yeah. Sure. I'll do a better job. Um, yeah, I think it comes up with my parents. And even, you know, they don't live here, they live far away. So there's always, uh, you know, I feel like I have to like reform myself when I am with them again or something. And it's yeah. someone from a different place and time yeah uh, so i really feel it yeah i'm with people who knew me especially when i was young um younger yeah yeah and you know that's interesting i think one part of the pain identity can be really this this you know something we ideally or hopefully would like to leave behind but still kind of, you know, shows up. And it's really hard to make changes and become more fully who we are. Some people don't like it, right? <laughs> they want us to stay like we were, especially if we catch on to like, for example, our codependency or we start setting boundaries. Everyone's like, no, no, no. What are you trying to do here? This isn't, it's not my nice friend anymore, right? So yeah, it's like this kind of, you know, stuck in time experience. Yeah. 
anybody else notice that there's a particular arena in which they experience? Uh, Chris, Daniel, yeah. The type of work I do requires traveling to a lot of different locations and each location has a lot of different variables that are outside of my control. And I, in some of them, I can do the same kind of, the same exact lesson plan as I will at another site. And it will go really great at one site and not great at another or really mm -hmm. challenging. And the way I feel about each one of those, you know, it feels like I'm either great or I suck. Right. And that is annoying to me because mm -hmm. I'd like to find a way of engaging with it. Yeah. That doesn't have all of that. Kind of like you're saying the ping pong. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to learn a, a model of what that even might look like. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So, you know, with a named person who talked about their parents or like this part in the past that kind of holds us back. And then there can be the density of our present time emotions that lock us into the pain identity. Right. So when we feel um, that maybe anxiety or or worry or frustration with ourself in that moment, it, it's like our entire experience. And so much of the pain identity is like typified by these emotions that are so strong, it feels like who we are. And he says at one point in the book, even when we're experiencing kind of like the most wretched form of like self-criticism or anxiety, there's actually like space in it. There's like space in it. And so instead of like, I'm going to get rid of it, I'm going to push it away. It's like, how do we find the space within it? You know, and I think it's, it sounds like a koan or like a, you know, a puzzle we need to fix, but there is a sense that even let's say, you know, the lesson plan went poorly and we're like, man, I suck. This is bad. There is like a moment if that thought doesn't continue where there's space. And then, oh, wait, yeah, it went really bad. And I should have, and I could, but there's like always that, that brief moment that generally most of us would never catch on to without this training in noticing something so simple and so boring as the breath. And that's how our mindfulness shows up for us. Our ability to recognize and track, you know, metacognition or like the experiences and understand, maybe not even understanding, just to recognize thoughts, feelings, and emotions as they arise, and then notice the gap. I think that's, it's interesting, because his solution of how do we work with being fixated on something difficult? Just be there. <laughs> how do we get unstuck? Stay. And it reminds me, you know, um, I had like this necklace and I traveled with it and it got all tangled and I was trying to, I was just trying to like kind of pull it apart, make it untangle, but there's no way. And that's like, we get caught in the emotion. We're trying to like pull and like push and do all, like we're trying to kind of effort our way out of our experience when really we, we kind of need to get more like loose and be with it and like slowly untangle what needs to get untangled. So that idea of not kind of reacting to the pain as a way of being with the pain. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. I saw Chris and Tom. Yeah. Um, I find when I'm waiting for somebody to respond to an email or a text that I send, it just gets filled with all of this anxiety about mm. they don't like me, I'm going to get fired. They hate me. Why did I even? It's just like that space, mm. and I keep looking and seeing and checking, and I'm saying, "Okay, I'm going to be cool. I'll, 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 I'll give them, I'll give them five minutes." <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, but but the experience is just filled with all of this sense of like all of my bad fantasies yeah. of who I am in relation to all of these people. It just gets it's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, again, according to Wangel Rinpoche, because he's really coming, some of you know this word, but a Dzogchen point of view, like a aspect of Tibetan Buddhism point of view, where like nothing is unworkable. Um, he says it, it's really funny. Uh, 
<laughs> I don't know if he knows that uh, he says it's called the all is good teaching. And I'm like, oh, I wish he knew this phrase. It's all good. Cause I bet, I bet he'd love that. You know, he likes, but the, so I keep wanting to call it, it's all good, but the all is good. Uh-huh. You know, this idea. And you, you often hear, um, Chogyam Trumpa and, and his student Pema Chodron talk a lot about this, like, you know, there's no no need for like an escape, right? There's just mm-hmm. being with. Yeah. And that that push against the anxiety of not knowing if we're good or loved is what creates so much of the pain identity. Not the anxiety, the push against the mm-hmm. feeling of anxiety. Yeah, I know it's very unbelievable, but actually when we kind of follow that thread, it it can it can prove to be quite true. Yeah, thank you. Chris, did you have uh doesn't Zog Chen translate as the great perfection or something like that? Boom. That was the word that I was proud of a couple of weeks ago. Um, But to to riff off what you guys were saying, I have, and I know I'm not alone in this. Other people call it this too. Uh, The bad boss, the internal at work, you know, no matter what I'm working on, I'm supposed to be working on that over there, you know, Mm -hmm. and especially because I work for myself now and it's just... What you just uh, wait, you work for yourself and you have a bad boss. So you're the bad boss? Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. Uh, I'm the internal bad boss. Oh gosh. I don't even I'm internal. No, I'm telling myself it's that's like, hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm constantly giving myself a horrible performance review. Mm-hmm. And and so what you're saying, it's like now I can say well, thank you for reminding me that I need to renew my driver's license. Mm. But right now, I'm paying my liability insurance. There we go. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's so interesting is in that all is good approach, and in some ways, the opposite of the pain identity is really touching into basic goodness like that we're always already good. You know, that's so fundamental in the Dzogchen teaching. So you're not good when you do this, that, or the other. You know, it's not something you need to create. It's always already here. Jimmy. Well, I've I've been thinking about this, and and when you came up with the it's all good kind of thing, that that really really resonates with me mm. i i learned as a child keep it to yourself mm. and when i'm going through difficult stuff that's what i tend to do is keep it to myself i mean in the last 5 years i've i had three deaths of very close family members and uh, a a breakup of a romantic relationship. And I was journaling about this last night and it was all about how I was keeping it to myself Mm -hmm. through all of those events that what I was going through wasn't as bad as what the other people in yeah. my family were going through. It wasn't as bad as as what everybody else had to deal with. So just keep it to yourself. Don't make it worse for everybody else. Just, you know, deal with your own shit. Hmm. And it's like, it's really mean mm. for me to do that yeah. to myself. Yeah. Really, really mean. Well, as I was journaling, and this is something that you touched on a little while ago, I started looking through it, and, I, and it was like, I, 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 and there was all this I in it. And I went through this exercise of trying to take the I out of the words and see how that worked without me in it yeah. as, uh, as, a, 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 as I. Yeah. And it was... 
the experience of these events and the experience of these emotions um, and responses to these events without the eye in it, 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 it felt different. Yeah. The, the description really felt different. Yeah. Um, and so now I, I'm, you know, I might want to start working on that, keeping it to myself stuff. So I've got people in my life that are willing yeah. to listen. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting. Two things. One is, We can share deeply about our hurt and pain and it can still be all good, right? They're not, they don't have to be different. And I think many of us are conditioned to feel that in order to share about something, we got to like tie a little bow on it and just, yeah, there can be like, yeah, it's good and hard, you know, like that holding both together. And, you know, it's interesting, you bring up language and words and, and how the words really influence how we see ourselves and, and how others see us. And there is actually really great research. <laughs> um, people who use more I and less we and us generally score as less empathic, right? When just talking about almost any given situation. So the words do matter. And there's some reason to believe that you can actually intervene and instruct people, start you know, thinking about we and us, and they do end up not only writing and thinking that way, but having that proclivity to think about others more. So it's so important the way that we use words and also the way that we frame our experience. In some ways, the pain identity is how do we respond to the inevitable suffering of life? moment to moment, and then also those big stories we carry around with us. So Rinpoche says that sometimes we get the pain identity through what he calls soul loss, and this loss of our intrinsic basic goodness. Mm -hmm. And he identifies our soul as, as made up of like the beautiful elements. You know, our soul is earth and water and fire and air and space all of that within us, all the qualities of that within us, all the groundedness and the comfort and the inspiration, the flexibility, all of that is within us and it gets kind of jolted out of us, sometimes through really difficult life events that we, the way, you know, not just the life event, but again, the way we're centralizing around them. And this is really tough because we don't want to get into like a victim blaming mode of, Oh, people who struggle with, you know, difficult traumatic events, it's it's just their attitude about it. They need to really start being more fluid and spacious. And it does mean there is room for us in how we are holding our difficulty. Like it's it's both, right? And um and it is, you know, it is really hard. Like um in another book actually Rinpoche talks about he's very honest that so many of his students want to share their problems with him and he would love to share with them that they're the problem and like not in a rude way but just like you are making this a problem you know you're making this a problem because you're stuck on it you're identifying with it you know um but yeah so it's it's interesting that kind of orientation and there is this belief, you know, in Dzogchen and in these teachings that if we turn towards our difficulties, we meet them, we open to them, that they naturally self-liberate. I know I've said that before. I still don't believe it, but I, I really like it. It has a very beautiful, like, I want to believe it, you know, like I want to, I want to see that possibility and I appreciate in, in Buddhism, um, Tibetan Buddhism especially, there's always these relative and ultimate um, layers and levels. So for example, you know, the, the relative level of compassion is um, me, let's say, 
noticing someone struggling to get their stroller in their car and, you know, and their baby's crying and things are difficult and I'm able to come in and help. Well, that's really nice to do. It's really nice to see instead of just rushing by, like I do something nice like that ultimate level of compassion is that I'm responding to literally everything in the world with just so much care. And I, um, I shared this story the other night, so I, I want to share it again. It always inspires me. Um, and this was a story when um, 30 years after the Dalai Lama had, had left Tibet, his teacher who had le left just after him was imprisoned, caught along the way. Um, and tortured for many years, right? It was living in a prison and tortured and finally released. And he reunites with the Dalai Lama and they're embracing each other and, you know, crying. And the Dalai Lama says, weren't you afraid? Weren't you scared being in that prison? He says, so afraid. I almost lost my compassion for the guards. <laughs> That's ultimate compassion. That's ultimate compassion right? That that is, it's so much in you that how we respond to anything difficult is with the point of view that everything is past, that we can just live that way. Um, and I guess, you know, it's, again, it's kind of like that, the thing that's in a tangle that you pull and it makes it tighter versus the thing that's in the tangle and you kind of let it loose so it can unwind itself. Some of that idea is, it's not just that we're Okay, okay, things are hard. I'm gonna handle it. You know, like I'm having these difficult thoughts about why didn't I get a text back? Like I'll just handle it, you know, like white knuckle handle it. We're going to these three precious pills, right? We're actually infusing our mind stream, our body, and our heart with these very beneficial qualities. And then maybe that which feels so difficult and is so hard does have more space. Maybe naturally self-liberates. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I think it's it's definitely worth looking at the way that our many coping mechanisms don't work and can contribute to this pain identity and body so that we get inspired to figure out, okay, if those habits and patterns aren't working, what might work? And and I'm not assuming everyone in the room here doesn't have healthy coping strategies. I'm I'm sure there are a lot of healthy coping strategies here to some occasionally. Yes, at least. But this idea of, you know, that the true inner refuge is cultivating that sense of spaciousness and silence and stillness. It's very it's very compelling. And it does have to be something we kind of investigate and, and notice or feel for ourselves. Um, any questions or clarifications or confessions on the pain identity? Yes, please. Do you mind using the mic? Thanks. And just so folks know, it's not an amplified mic. It's just so folks at home can hear. Okay. So you don't want to fixate on it and you don't want to be the problem, but you want to turn towards it and be curious and it unravels. Um, what does that look like? <laughs> right, because you want to help, you want to be somewhat action, action oriented. Yeah, right. I guess that's the question. Yeah, yeah. And that it's a good segue. Yeah, we should do the practice before I ramble on too much longer. Um, so he, he describes we're going to come back to these three precious pills and I'll just remind us of what those are and in in many meditations you hear people start saying settle your body speech and mind into their natural states and we think of these um these doors uh, into our experience you know the physical body and then our inner speech and then mind and awareness so important for these to be kind of in alignment, in balance before we consider doing anything. And it's interesting because the way that he invites us to look at this is we're just returning to what's natural. Even though for many of us, the idea that our natural state of body is stillness is, is not normal. And there's many layers there too. It's not just stillness. 
it's, you know, he describes it here that as we connect with the first inner refuge, the I or sense of I clears because we begin to realize the truth of who we are. We already are the space and awareness, but that has been obscured. The moment we become more open, we're also more open to our pain. Since we are no longer defending our contracted identity, the suffering dissipates and we experience a sense of greater freedom. So just turning towards the body and we'll be doing this together, inviting this sense of kind of openness and this quality, especially of stillness in the body as a choice, like we move towards stillness in the body as opposed to doing and acting and responding. And then the second, right, which is settling the inner speech, so tricky. Inner speech is so active and busy, so much content to go there, just so much stimulation for most of us on a day-to-day -day basis. And then again, that whole project of what is this, what is that, and managing all that information that's coming in. He says that the second inner refuge, this settling the speech into silence, mm, shows us the light of awareness. It brings clarity and presence. Our pain no longer seems so solid. Our pain identity begins to loosen and dissolve as we rest in unbounded spaciousness. Awareness of the spaciousness within the body, within both the pain and the pain identity, liberates the energy invested in the pain. I gotta say that again. Awareness of the spaciousness within both the pain and the pain identity liberates the energy invested in the pain. Now the energy becomes available for healing. And even if the impulse to contract arises, we do not give in to it. So often this inner speech is us making a plan, right? A plan to be safe, a plan to be okay, a plan to you know, change or shift something. And if we stop all of that, I mean, the incredible energy of our thoughts. Are you guys ever impressed with how many thoughts you can have, how compulsive they are, how redundant they are? Like, like, there's, a, like there's a lot of energy and it's all locked up in the pain identity. And if we just open in this sense of like, unbounded spaciousness that energy it goes back to our body to let it and you know into our awareness to let itself naturally heal so there's many analogies for kind of thoughts and awareness i personally like the idea of the waves in the ocean for some obvious reasons um and you know this idea that when our thought is coming it's like it's taking the energy of our awareness and rising up but if we see it for what it is, if we let it just return, then we have that energy back to us. Just, it's like so exhausting, the amount of energy we are putting into these thoughts and plans and imaginings and fantasies about what's wrong or, or what's right. So this idea that, especially when we're talking about the energy of our thoughts about what's wrong, that the awareness of spaciousness that there's a spaciousness within the pain and the pain identity, meaning it's not solid, it's not all the time, that we can actually find some relaxation right there. It liberates that. Like all of a sudden it's like, why am I even, who cares? You know, like, let's just come back. And now the energy becomes available for healing. And and that's a, a little bit of a important you know, you, you have to have a little bit of faith in a way that this body and mind knows how to heal itself, that we actually already have what we need within us to heal ourselves. And that's, you know, our, our, our mind and body systems can get very out of aligned and we need help. There's no question, but that at a kind of fundamental level, we are basically what we are looking for. We are the goodness we are seeking that is a bit of the um, insight we get as we settle the body and we settle the speech. And then the third inner refuge of warmth is embodied and can support all physical changes. Um, taking the three refugees, refu refuges in sequence 
First, we address the producer of the pain, the energetic dimension of the pain, and then the pain itself. Mm -hmm. Instead of a pain body or pain identity, there is the body of emptiness or unbounded spaciousness, first refuge. Instead of pain speech, there's a body of light, infinite awareness, the second refuge. And instead of a pain mind, there is a body of great bliss or genuine warmth, the third. In actuality, there's no sequence to the inner refuge. Space always contains all the qualities of light and warmth. But when your connection to the refu refuge is blocked and obscured, step-by-step -step can help. So let's do it. So we'll do not a not all the way to 7.30. We'll do a little bit of a in-between practice here. But really thinking of especially how do we use these inner refuges to support loosen this pain identity. Oh yeah, I should mention, if you want to stand up and stretch, I know we've been sitting for a minute, don't want anyone to fall asleep. I've never fallen asleep teaching, so I'm good. Anything could happen though. Yes, good. Friends at home, stretching too. Nice when there's good music. Mm. There's my preference, though. All right. Reconnect to the posture, that wonderful uprightness and softness. Inhale, finding the vividness, and exhale, finding the ease. And then we move to this first of our three precious pills by bringing our attention and awareness fully into the body. And as we experience awareness in the body, we may notice a sense of spaciousness, not just feeling as though our awareness is in the form body, but a sense of spaciousness and openness beyond the body. This just means we don't have to really have a sense of where the body begins or ends. We just land our attention and awareness here. And notice this potential of openness as we connect to this quality of stillness in the body. Whatever pain we are carrying with us tonight, whatever heartbreak, angst, worry, anger, we can host it from this body of stillness. Mm. 
Breathing in, simply sensing this body. Breathing out, noticing and inviting the quality of stillness. We pay attention to the body. We start to notice the subtle energies in the body, the movement and flow and undulation. And this can help us maybe feel the sense of the body as a body of spaciousness. We could feel or imagine the stillness as a sense of peace, like a very clear and still lake, no wind, no movement whatsoever, peaceful and tranquil all the way down, even with all the aliveness that exists within that lake or pond. From this stillness, maybe there's a little bit of inkling towards the silence. And we move towards silencing the inner speech or a sense of choosing no longer to look outward, no longer to cling into planning, considering, fixing, Inviting inner silence right here into the stillness. We can settle our inner speech with a very gentle but very steady focus on the breath. Oh. There may be many thoughts, 
And even if that is true, there are these moments, these gaps and pauses between the breath where we experience the silence. And if you notice the thought, you can return to the breath. Feel and imagine that energy returning right back into the body, to awareness, back into this healing process already happening. Imagine hosting whatever pain is here, whatever heartbreak or worry, frustration, longing, hosting it not only in the stillness, but hosting it here in the silence. When the thoughts quiet down, we see the bright light of our awareness. It really doesn't matter how many times you get carried away. Just as long as you keep coming back, refinding the breath, reconnecting with the intention of stillness and silence. Part of what helps us to keep coming back and then stay. Considering the possibility that whatever it is we're seeking with these thoughts and memories and images might actually be right here in the stillness and in the silence. And now as we move to the sense of warmth and openness, we find the radiance of our inner light, that which is always already okay. This unbounded sacred space of the mind, heart, and body. And we could feel almost as though we were opening up into a very wide vista, and panoramic, can see all around us a sense of warmth and connection with this wide openness.
Keep leaning back in the mind. Keep feeling the spaciousness and warmth. And within that, these qualities of silence and stillness are already there. This is the place of all is good. Nothing that arises is a problem. Just finding the warmth and spaciousness around it so it becomes less dense and returning to this natural state of body, speech, and mind. Stillness, silence, warmth, and openness. Reconnecting to posture, finding the softness and the uprightness. And then dropping even more deeply into this presence with body, speech, and mind. Thank you for your practice. I really could feel some sense of your practice. It's really beautiful to feel that. I don't know if I mentioned the next book we're going to do together is The Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody really pumped? It's such a classic text. It's it's just so beautiful and really beautiful secondary text by Pema Chodron makes it feel alive today. So we'll follow that version. And I think of it because at the end of my practice, I always do the little, little version of the Bodhisattva prayer. Um, really nice to remember what we practice for, right? So that we can be more available for others and that just helps anchor the practice through, right? It's so nice for our little pain identity to get 
some reprieve. We don't stop there, right? We don't stop there. We keep going. So would love to hear any questions or reflections and um, yeah, especially from folks haven't heard from, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm curious to hear um, any advice that you might have of how we can sort of continue this feeling of stillness, of inner peace, mm -hmm. in, of contentment in our day to day living. When oftentimes we're we're geared to have to sort of move faster, think faster, be ambitious. Um, and I, I think, you know, a lot of people have mentioned things similar in their comments earlier. Um, because I, I guess the idea is that where I find myself now sometimes is that it's sort of the, the black and white situation mm -hmm. where it's just like, you know, be 300% and then just zonk out and meditate. Yes. Um, so if you have any advice in terms of um, how at the very least we can, you know, lightly incorporate that, that stillness practice within our busy day to days. Yeah. Um, knowing that still we need to maintain some of that essence in order to feed ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful question. And what's your name? I'm Chris. Chris. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Kind of the um, $1 billion question. Um, and luckily, you know, uh, I don't live in a cave as a yogi, so I, I can really relate to so many um, demands and, and so much fullness and busyness. You know, for sure, we always have an opportunity right when we open our eyes in the beginning of the day and right when we go to sleep to really reset our motivation and intention. And I find that to be pretty helpful. So on the days, even if we don't get a formal practice to wake up and feel that sense of, you know, can I just for this moment feel my body as still and peaceful and warm? And consider, may I bring some of this into my day with me? Like that prospective reminder. And at the end of the day, there's so many beautiful um, recommendations for at the end of the day practices and the traditions, but some is, you know, I know I fell out of presence and peace and warmth today. And it's okay, but I'm going to refine it right now. Like, because we lose ourselves over and over and over. We lose ourselves over and over and over throughout the day. We fall out of presence. We're like some other universe of planning and thinking, or we're just doing, right? We're doing what we need to do. And that sometimes kind of uproots us out from ourselves. I, I invite all of us, especially if you haven't tried this before, you can do a lot in a moment of a moment of really just even in one inhale and exhale, just this kind of sense of inhaling. I'm only experiencing everything through my body of the inhale, exhale. I'm releasing everything. And just doing that three times, especially with the, the belly breathing, the diaphragmatic breath, because it does help calm and downregulate for us. It actually can do a lot. And it's not just, you know, the modern busy life, like even in the ancient traditions, there is that really specific instruction, many moments of awareness throughout the day. Like this is really important. And there was a study out of the University of Madison, Wisconsin, a group there that looked at the relative benefits of practicing once a day for 30 minutes and then many moments of awareness, like a minute or two a day, also just as much of benefit. You should still practice for 30 minutes in the day, if you can and when you can, because there is a deepening that happens in practice, um, but I think it's really encouraging. So it doesn't just feel like, oh, like you said, either I'm meditating or I'm like doing that other thing. That's the rest of my life. Um, and how do we, yeah, like, and I like this idea, like how do we, you know, keep finding these little pockets of spaciousness throughout our experience. And most of it, like at its simplest level is like, stop thinking about what you need to do, who you need to be, whatever else is going on. Just experience the sensory 
experience of, of life in the moment, then that could be also, it doesn't, if you don't feel like closing your eyes and you know that it just could be putting on a song that really takes you and really being in the song, right? Maybe not super energetic. So that's kind of a different practice, but something where, you know, you're really in that sensory experience of sound, or maybe you're watching, not with a like looking kind of gaze, but with a soft gaze, you're just watching like, I mean, everything's so beautiful right now, all the leaves and the trees, and you're just watching and seeing it's also. So, yeah, thank you so much. And it really is that intention to do it at the beginning of the day it makes a really big difference. So that would be helpful. Yeah. Yes. Can you say, say your name also? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm Belinda. Belinda. I just want to follow up on that, and then I have a separate question. Okay. okay. Um, we're still in like a we need to be productive too in in today's world. So, is is there also a way to bring that in to be productive to be like fully aware and have the sensory? What would that look like? Um, it's like when we work, we uh, we still need to go to work and deliver. Yeah, you will be so much more productive if you're not scattered. So most of our separate self and identity and pain identity, we're actually not very productive. We mm -hmm. just have this illusion that we're getting things done because we're stressed out. Mm -hmm. But we don't get things done when we can't pay attention. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I will say, though, I have a little hesitation. I, I work in, um, in corporate settings where we want to quantify meditation for productivity. And I like, I don't, I think it's a rip off, right? Because there's so much more depth to spiritual practice than getting things done. Mm -hmm. And even if we need to get things done for our work, we have to be clear on our motivation. Mm -hmm. And if our motivation isn't to be of service, we will not be happy. Forget not do good. We will not be happy. Like happiness in life is really being clear on our sense of purpose and our purpose is other people right and being of service so i just think like i hear what you're saying but i don't want us to think like i'm meditating so i can get more done sleep less and that's all true right but we will and it you know our focused ability to be paying attention in a relaxed way like that is truly like it's the single skill that all of us would want to do anything painting coding you know carpentry that's what we all need. And we're so distracted by the pain identity that we can't focus. So it's not like, oh, I'm meditating and I'm not productive. Like, absolutely helps us, but really keep right on intention or else we're kind of just, you know, uh, covering over the wound um, and not really helping. So yeah, great question. And then um, just on the concept you brought up loosely holding the identity. Yeah. Um, I think it's really enlightening, but I think just want to hope you can expand more on it. Yeah. I feel like a lot of times I get angry or get yes. nervous, but I'm holding on to it. I know that's yeah. not good, but I don't want to let it go. I feel like there's someone sort of feel unsafe. Like if I yeah. just don't care about it, well, well, who am I? Yeah. Um, God, you're asking great works. questions. Thank you so much, Belinda. Do you know we have another Belinda here? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can talk after. <laughs> Doesn't does not happen very often. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think I do think that the only way to approach, especially, you're you're so right. The, we are so much who we are when we're angry. We're so in the pain identity, and it's me and it's you when we're angry. Like that is like maybe the one. The, like the single most emotion <laughs> of reifying self and other. And with anger, you know, it's always about compassion for ourselves and for the others. And I think that these four practices, the loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity, like these practices are like the necessary um, orientation for how we meet difficulties. Like that's really, um, it's really important and that we practice them. Again, we can do this, you know, what I was describing to Chris is like an on the spot practice. We do it on the spot in the moment. We can do on the spot compassion all the time, right? Um, I had an opportunity this morning, I was driving and um, this woman's all 
like in your lane and i was like what the fuck love you <laughs> like, we're good like you're just doing you got that dope car like you're good <laughs> like we can in the moment kind of like up, like really apply the remedy and it's not like she wasn't driving in a crazy way and it wasn't okay like it doesn't make what anyone else doing is okay but it softens the like oh like i'm right there wrong right maybe there was someone giving birth in the back seat right we never know uh, that's always the thing that we can like hold in our mind possibly of how do we loosen the sense of me and mine and theirs is wrong there's a lot with compassion like, there's no there's no upper limit of compassion practice and helping work with our pain identity yeah great question um before we dedicate the merit i do want to say or actually we'll do it after dedicate the merit because i think that'll be more fun so now you have a cliffhanger you're excited you're but try to release the excitement and come back to the body and the breath. And if it feels comfortable, putting hands together in front of the chest, the symbolic gesture of offering this practice. And take whatever spark is alive in your heart of wanting to be of service thinking of not only those close to us, but this world that needs more compassionate beings. Feel that call, that motivation. And in that spirit, we dedicate the energy of this practice tonight together in the hope and aspiration that all beings could know safety and ease. All beings could be healthy and strong. That each and every being could be free from delusion. That all beings could be truly happy. Great to be here with you all. Thank you so much for coming.